The pros and cons of virtual learning, how one district is teaching during the pandemic. It's gonna look different and there might be new challenges, but we're gonna get through it. The safety of travelers at the Tucson International Airport. It'll probably be well into next year before we start to see things get a little bit back to normal. The end of an era as the Pima County Attorney's Office prepares for new leadership. I hit the ground running after 20 years in the office when I took office. Hello and welcome to Arizona 360. I'm Lorraine Rivera. Thanks for joining us. After receiving more guidance from the state about how to safely reopen, schools across Arizona will make their decisions based on the threat COVID-19 poses at the county level. For now, learning will remain online. We saw what that looks like for a teacher in Vail. The first day of school at Mesquite Elementary had the trappings of a typical start. All right, kids, we have a two minute warning. A day of introductions. Go to our Monday folder. Except for the screen that separated educators like Shannon Jelly. There's the link right there. From her fifth graders. We started our day going over what our technology expectations or tech expectations, I like to call them. I wanna give everybody a chance to present. Kids were still very excited to see each other. They were still curious and asked questions about me. There was some nervousness on the part of the students and that's normal too. It's a different kind of nervous, but it's typical of a first day and I think they settled in really well. Classrooms across Arizona are virtual for the time being. Benchmarks released by the Arizona Department of Health Services recommend counties meet three criteria before schools can bring students back for traditional in-person instruction. That includes a two-week drop in weekly average COVID-19 cases, two weeks with a positive test rate below 7%, and two weeks where COVID-like illnesses make up less than 10% of hospital visits. Pima County anticipates schools will have to wait until after Labor Day to explore their options. And we're going to move on to our next activity. Jelly spent the first day acquainting students with the technological demands of their current environment. Darlene, I think you might be muted. And taking the first steps to form a relationship, she says, is crucial to successful learning, both online and face to face. It's like building any relationship. And I think if they know that they matter to me and that their learning matters to me, that we're going to have an awesome year, no matter what format it's in. In the meantime, Jelly foresees some immediate challenges with online teaching. Kids get bored even when they're in person. But she's also quick to identify a silver lining. Having the chance to teach students to use tech as a tool, not just something for video games or social media. An educator who has spent the last five years at Mesquite, she looks forward to the day her students can return to class. As soon as it's safe, I cannot wait to have them back, to hear and see them in the halls, to watch them physically raise their hands, and we're gonna get through it. It's gonna look different and there might be new challenges, but we're gonna get through it. If you need me, reach me in Schoology. Bye. Bye. Mesquite Elementary is part of the Vail School District. The district includes more than 20 campuses and more than 12,000 students. Providing them with an education while protecting them from the coronavirus presents an ongoing challenge. We learned how the district is handling both from Superintendent John Carruth. Yeah, we're starting uh, quite smoothly, actually. Uh, we put uh, uh, a huge amount of time and effort into developing what remote learning will look like and making sure that we're doing that um, in a much more robust way than what we ended fourth quarter. John, I know this isn't a fair question this early in the game, but what are the plans for a possible re-entry to face-to-face -face instruction? The next phase from remote learning will be um, what's kind of being termed hybrid learning. And uh, fundamentally, from an instructional educational standpoint, we are going to need to provide enhanced social distancing, um, reduced class sizes, uh, and um, cohorting of students. So small, if you just think about it, smaller groups on campuses, that would really be the next phase. Um, our ultimate goal is to have students back in in-person learning environments. Um, I think we all understand um, that that is the best environment for, for kids and families, and that's our, that's our goal. Uh, with the public health guidance, though, we are, we're using that as a light to, to light our way to, to that path. 
Will alternatives be offered to teachers and students who say they don't feel safe returning to in-person? Yeah, we are um, all along the way, we will have choices for our, um, our parents and, and where they want to send uh, their kids. We do now, as we turn that dimmer switch up and as more uh, students are able to come on campuses, we will continue to have an option for remote um, learning Will teachers have the same option if they don't feel ready? We're working with staff and we, when we can provide that flexibility to staff, we are certainly going to, to, to offer that. And what we are absolutely doing is if any teacher is in an at-risk category um, or, or student, though they are, we are working with them and accommodating them. For people who are uncomfortable, if that's a short-term uncomfortable piece, we're working with you on that. Um, if it's a longer-term thing, we may or may not be able to accommodate that based on what the need is. Um, so we're just, we're having really individual conversations with people. I think for everybody, there's an emotional component to this. And um, as they, as people understand what the safety precautions are and protocols, they get more comfortable with um, the setting. And, and what we didn't have uh, up until last week was public health guidance on when is it reasonably safe. We won't do that. We won't be bringing kids back in a large way until public health metrics say it's reasonably safe to do so. You've been quite candid about some of the challenges facing the district and the some 12,000 students um, and their families. Are there any silver linings at this point? Uh, as I have often said, I, I realize I much prefer reading about historic events than living one. Uh, and uh, that said, we the classrooms that we left in uh, late February, early March, they are in a time capsule from an era um, that we are not returning to. Digital tools that we're using uh, now, we are on such a steep learning curve. We won't go back from that. We are learning so many really great ways of connecting and using digital digital tools to do that. I, I don't see us going back and just shelving these tools once um, once we're able to fully return to in-person learning. And I'm excited, honestly, to see what that opens up, what the possibilities are. All right, something to gain from all this. John Carruth, Superintendent of Vail Unified School District, thanks for your time. Thank you very much. As schools look to mitigate the risks of an outbreak on campus, they find themselves in a similar position as businesses, wondering if their actions could result in a lawsuit. For clarification, we reached out to Tara Sklar, an expert in health law and policy with the University of Arizona College of Law. As long as schools are taking all reasonable care to follow the guidance that's been given to them um, through their school districts or county health departments or state, they are protecting themselves against liability. They're showing they're taking um, reasonable efforts to make sure that their, their staff and their students are safe. What sort of expectation should a school community have for privacy in the time of COVID? Um, can they say things like, what about HIPAA laws? Right, no, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, HIPAA is the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. It is very specific that it only covers entities that are healthcare providers and healthcare plans. A school is neither of those entities. So um, you can have protect privacy of your students and teachers uh, and still be transparent. You can just de-identify the names of the individuals that may have tested positive for COVID and, and still let the community and the parents and families and teachers know um, this is how many cases we have, this is our regular reporting, just be as transparent as possible about the information that's out there to avoid any type of public backlash because there really is no legal precedent or law for why you would not want to share that information. As schools begin to evaluate whether or not they would be able to open in the traditional sense face-to-face, -face, what sorts of things can they learn from perhaps the way nursing homes have been handled? One of the key things that's helping nursing homes that did not have a positive outbreak, which is very strong leadership and knowing and following the guidance that isn't mandatory, it's the same as nursing homes. Um, it's not mandatory for schools to follow the guidance that's being released from the health department, but there's still the guidance is still out there in terms of what to do to help socially distance and um, and keep teachers and students as safe as possible. And also from a, a legislation or a legal perspective, um, what happened with nursing homes could also happen with schools, which is something to really watch for, where they were required to take COVID-19 COVID positive residents 
um, and care for them, even though they may have lacked the training in terms of uh, infection control procedures, the proper uh, PPE, and they were yet still had no way to turn back these potential residents. And the same thing could happen with schools, but it may be required to have students come, especially students that are under certain eligibility categories, such as special needs, or those who are children of essential workers. And um, the schools may be required to care for them, even though they may lack the proper training and the proper PPE to isolate these students. So this is a very similar area where the law can almost be enabling spread as opposed to preventing it. It is possible to bring larger groups of people together and do so safely and prevent any sort of risk of spreading. But how do you do that? Right. So again, because of such a lack of clear guidance, it really comes down to this individual leadership. And, and in those cases where we've seen very little, if any, spread, it was those CEOs and that administrative team putting in place um, nurses or other infection control specialists that put in protocols and procedures, training, PPE, to make sure all those things are taken care of. And what we're seeing right now with schools is even schools that have nurses on staff may not be utilizing those nurses in those um, safe return plans. So that would be really key to get that measure under control. And that's what many um, nursing homes have done uh, is, to, is to start with infection control procedures. Um, the second thing that they've done is they eliminated what's not necessary. Uh, so if someone could work virtually, they do work virtually. They limit contact as much as possible. Um, there is some backlash to that as we've seen with um, nursing home residents needing to have more contact with their families. You're a law professor who has an expertise in public health. It sounds like you're saying there are ways to safely reopen. Is that accurate? Yes, I think that we're seeing that around the world. There are ways to safely reopen, but it involves uh, discipline, communal effort, transparency with the data, ongoing communication. It, it is not it is not something that we can just have wishful thinking and we can magically reopen. It is a, an ongoing effort. Currently, if I want to go to a grocery store or drug store, et cetera, I don't have to sign a waiver. But in this pandemic, things are getting a little gray. Is it possible that we could be headed in that direction where you would have to sign some sort of form assuming a risk before you enter a property? I mean, you can sign a form and it won't take away your right to file a lawsuit if you're harmed. If they're just generally not enforceable uh, contracts. I have yet to see that it's business as usual anywhere. Um, people really are taking measures to, you know, try to require masks, encourage masks, have hand sanitizing stations, keep tables far apart. Um, you know, these are all measures that say that this uh, place of business did practice reasonable care in trying to keep people safe. So for those reasons, it would just be very, very difficult for someone to say, um, you know, you didn't practice uh, reasonable care and that's why I got sick. First of all, it'd be very hard to even show that you got sick from that particular place in time. And then to be so sick that you had severe damages that you're then asking that business to pay for. Um, it's best to just understand that you're assuming risk by going and for companies to try to keep people as, as safe as possible. Okay, Tara Sklar joining us from the U of A College of Law. Thanks for your time. Thank you. During the pandemic, the Tucson International Airport has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on equipment to keep visitors and workers safe, all while managing steep financial losses tied to declining air travel. Tony Paniagua has more. Thank you for using Tucson International Airport. The coronavirus pandemic is keeping billions of people at home around the world, but Tucson International Airport is an essential business. TUS CARES, remember this. My mask protects you, and your mask protects me. It continues to operate 24-7. You look around here, we still have to keep the facility open. There's still water bills and electric bills, and there's still security and fire departments and personnel that have a job to do. Um, our federal regulations do not care that we have a pandemic. We still have minimum standards to achieve. And the tasks are more financially challenging without its lifeblood. Flights to multiple destinations from different airlines and a steady stream of passengers who are willing to take them. The change has been absolutely dramatic. I mean, to the tune of about almost two million a month of lost revenue since the pandemic started. And uh, that's, that's tough. 
The loss comes from fewer sales at the airport's restaurants and stores, along with parking fees, to name a few. This time of year, summer's our slow season, so about 60 flights a day. And uh, right now, we're a little less than half of that. And the same is true for our passengers. We're about 37, 38 percent of normal right now because of the COVID and the flight reductions that the airlines have implemented. And now, because of the coronavirus, the airport has additional expenses in its annual budget of about $34 million. So far, the Tucson Airport Authority has spent more than a quarter million dollars on fighting the possible spread of the pandemic on its properties. We purchased new equipment uh, that sprays large areas much quicker than before. We've upgraded our chemicals to a hospital grade cleaning. Um, we've added in UV rays on the handrails of our escalators. We've added social distance signing on the floors, the seats, the elevators, and we've added plexiglass shields between the passengers and the workers at all of the transaction counters. While at the airport, we met Bailey Stewart and his mother Amber. They were returning to South Carolina after visiting family in Tucson. At $200 round trip per person, it ended up being a better deal than the trip they had planned earlier this year that got postponed because of the pandemic. Not really nervous, just more excited to be able to reunite, reunite with family. So we didn't feel like the pandemic should get in the way of that as far as everyday life. I do agree with taking safety precautions, which is why I'm wearing this mask, but I don't believe that we should stop everything in its tracks. For Suriel Medina, the journey was more imperative. Medina boarded three flights from his home in Grand Rapids, Michigan to get to Hermosillo, Sonora, where he picked up his 18-month-old daughter from her grandparents. From Hermosillo, the father and daughter traveled by land to Tucson to fly back to their final destination so little Camila can live with her parents again. It wasn't an option. Um, we kind of had to do it, but if we, we would have had another option, we would have took another option. Yep. Mm -hmm. Were you nervous or apprehensive? What um, was going through your mind? I'm not really nervous about this. Um, I believe in God and I know that God's taking care of me. So he's taking care of our family. At TIA, passenger traffic is gradually improving compared to the lowest numbers weeks ago. Officials say no businesses have closed permanently and the airport authority did not have to lay off anybody. As part of the CARES Act earlier this year, the federal government provided $10 billion to the nation's airports. TIA received $22.6 million that helped to soften the blow. Still, some airlines are projecting a 50% drop in business in 2021 compared to pre-COVID times, and the road to recovery remains uncertain. It'll probably be well into next year before we start to see things get a little bit back to normal. Of course, it's all tied to getting that vaccine and um, bringing these numbers down nationwide to get people more comfortable, um, you know, with going about their normal daily lives. After more than 20 years on the job, Pima County Attorney Barbara Lawall will leave her post at the end of the year. In October, Lawall announced that she would not seek a seventh term. This week, we spoke to her about her impact as the county's top prosecutor. Now, you've been a prosecutor for some 40 years, Pima County attorney for 24 years, and I know this is a tricky question, but looking back, what would you say you're most proud of? Oh, boy, I, there's a very long list. I think one of the things that I'm most proud of is the um, creative and innovative programs that I'm going to leave behind that I hope are built upon. And there's so many of them, but one of them that I'm really proud of is the Children's Advocacy Center. That is a really sterling, high quality forensic interviewing place for that's child friendly, that deals with some of our most vulnerable and uh, harmed victims. It's fair to say that Pima County has changed quite a bit in these 24 years that you've been leading the office. <laughs> What's left to be done? What would you have liked to implement that you just didn't get around to? Oh, well, I'm going to segue off of that because one of the things that was on my plate that I really wanted to have happen, but we're going to need a lot of money to make it happen, is to make the Children's Advocacy Center into a family advocacy center that deals with uh, adult victims of 
of domestic violence and sexual assault, as well as the child victims of uh, physical um, harm and, and child abuse and molestation. You've been criticized over the years for being too hard on certain things, too soft on others. What's missing in the conversation when it comes to those criticisms that you face? What don't people well, know? First of all, I'd be interested in what people think I'm too hard on and what they think I'm too soft on, because uh, those are inaccurate descriptions of me, of my office, and, and our policies. So, you know, I know I've heard that people think I'm too hard on drug crimes, but I have like 13 diversion programs that deal with uh, diverting people from prosecution, people who are arrested on, on drug possession offenses. We have never, since I've been the county attorney, I have never prosecuted anyone for personal possession of marijuana um, uh, since 1996. That hasn't happened if it's up to two pounds of marijuana. You know, that's a, a huge amount. People are, are put in diversion and given that opportunity to go through a treatment or community service program and not be prosecuted. So some of that criticism is just wrong, inaccurate, and unfounded. Let's shift course just a bit here. The pandemic has changed the way a lot of us do our jobs these days. What does that do to the backlog that occurs in legal systems all over the country, but here in Pima County? Well, the pandemic has had an incredible adverse effect on the cases in my office. Um, things have slowed down enormously. We're not having trials. Trials probably aren't going to occur in Pima County until October. And um, defense attorneys are often reluctant to get their clients in. The clients are not necessarily staying in touch with their attorneys. And so negotiations for plea agreements on those cases that should plead and not go to trial have slowed down also. So more and more hearings and um, motions and various other things are happening virtually um, on Zoom like we are right now. So that's pretty helpful, but still there's gonna be a big backlog when this pandemic ends. And finally, before we go, um, your successor is a, a, a defense attorney moving on to a prosecutor. Anything that you could do that would help ease the transition? Any words of advice that you'll be offering as you leave your post? Well, I've already reached out to Laura Conover, and I sent her an email offering her a one-on-one -on -one immersion with everybody in my office who's a division chief, a bureau chief, a trial supervisor, program director, supervisor, so that she can meet them one-on-one -on, -one on, on Zoom and ask them questions, have them do their bullet points on what their job duties and responsibilities are. I mean, she doesn't know what she doesn't know. And so it'll be really important for her to take me up on this offer and to be able to uh, meet people in the office of be an introduction to her. Uh, people are very anxious to meet her. They want to know who their new leader is going to be. Fair to say she'll have her work cut out for her. Oh, yes. You know, I, I hit the ground running after 20 years in the office when I took office and I was still gobsmacked a number of times by things I had no clue that I had to deal with. After 24 years, would you say there are things you're still learning even to this day about this job in Pima County? No question. I learn something every single day. I still make mistakes and what I try to do is clean them up and learn from them and move on. All right, some good advice there. Uh, Barbara Lawal, Pima County attorney, thank you for your time. You're welcome. The University of Arizona-led mission to bring an asteroid sample back to Earth is one step closer to its goal. This week, NASA's OSIRIS-REx carried out its final rehearsal of the steps it will take when it finally touches down on the asteroid Bennu to collect a sample. This event was months in the making. Principal investigator Dante Loretta spoke to Christopher Conover about the milestone. Dante, thanks for joining us. For people who maybe haven't been following every minute of this mission so far, 
Tell us what happened during this second and final rehearsal for Osiris Rex. On Tuesday, August 11th, 2020, the Osiris Rex team implemented the second sampling rehearsal called the Match Point Rehearsal. Match Point refers to a final maneuver that the spacecraft performs over the asteroid surface, which is designed to match the spacecraft's velocity with the rotational rate of the asteroid. This basically gets us hovering over the sample collection site and preparing for our descent down to make contact with the surface and collect that precious material. How close did you get to the surface of Bennu? Initial estimates suggest that we made it to within 41 meters of the asteroid surface as predicted. Did you do all of this because of COVID-19 remotely? We had to take in appropriate measures to ensure the safety of our team uh, as a result of the pandemic situation that we find ourselves in right now. There were a few key people in the Spacecraft Operations Center at Lockheed Martin in Littleton, Colorado. They are required to be on the flight network and on console to monitor the event as it takes place. But we had to space them out with appropriate um, distance to make sure that everybody remains safe. I was able to go into the building at the University of Arizona because we have a much better connection there. Uh, and we were in a large conference room with three of us total. We were wearing our face masks and we had four screens up so that we could look at all the different pieces of information that were coming in during the rehearsal event. What goes on between now and October when you go in for the final samples? So we are going to do a thorough analysis of all the information that was collected during this rehearsal event. So we're looking at uh, how the thrusters performed, how the software performed, how all the sensors performed, what our communication looked like uh, throughout the entire event. Everything looked great. So we're in really high spirits right now. We don't think that there are a lot of changes that are going to be made, but we are looking to get this just exactly perfect. If you see something you don't like, do you have the option to do another rehearsal or is it just redo the program, cross your fingers that everything works out the way you're expecting it to in October? Yeah, we'll go through a rehearsal success review uh, that's scheduled about two weeks from now, uh, the last week of August. So we'll, we'll have the team come forward with all of their analyses and all of their conclusions. And as a leadership team, we'll evaluate that information and we'll decide, was this rehearsal successful or is there something that's concerning enough that we need to plan a, another rehearsal before moving on to sample collection? I think that's unlikely, but that's, that we have the opportunity to do that if needed. And that's all for now. Thanks for joining us. To get in touch, visit us on social media or send an email to Arizona360 at azpm.org and let us know what you think. We'll see you next week.